Yeah, no, no, I just want to add something after Zahid, uh, because I was, uh, you know, the it's interesting, the details of court cases that were being given uh, in terms yeah. of appeals from the Arte Commission of Pakistan to the to the courts. Yeah. Uh, in Sri Lanka, if the update uh, vis-a-vis the situation here, we have had 10 yeah. appeals um, filed mm-hmm. against uh, orders of the Arte Commission. And uh, those appeals are interesting. Many of them, the majority of them are really by public authorities. And they're interesting because they show the uh, points at which power is challenged in Sri Lanka. So the one instance is, of course, the uh, declaration of assets of the prime minister, of the previous prime minister. And uh, we ordered disclosure of the of the declaration of assets uh, based on, of course, very well-founded principles of transparency and accountability. We went into very specific details about the interaction of Sri Lanka's 70s assets law with the RTI Act. Uh, because there again, there was a legal issue. Because though the though section four of the RTI <laughs> says that the RTI supersedes previous laws, um, the argument brought by the Attorney General in that case was that the 70th Assets Law was a specific law, and therefore it prevailed over the generalized RTI law of, of 2016. So we went into very specific legal details and justified the reasoning as to why the declaration of assets ought to be uh, disclosed by the prime by the president's office actually because the prime minister files the declaration to the president, and that's been appealed from that's been in the court of appeal now for the last three years. We also had another instance where we ordered the central bank of Sri Lanka to disclose how they have invested um, monies of the EPF and the ETF, you know, statutory public monies. Um, and that again has been appealed uh, from to the Court of Appeal. Um, then another instance is where an uh, order was uh, issued against the leading uh, bank, a state bank, the People's Bank, uh, based actually in this time on disclosure of the fees paid by them to lawyers um, in terms of how, uh, litigation uh, filed against a trade union for exposing uh, irregularities in the bank. And the trade union came to the commission and said that we need to know how much public funds have been expended by the People's Bank and paid to the lawyers uh, to fight these cases in court. But the principle the commission took at that time, at that point, was that the cumulative amount of legal fees could be disclosed, but the private details of the lawyers uh, need not be disclosed. And uh, because there are privacy concerns uh, in issue there, but the public funds in total should be disclosed uh, where the amounts were concerned. So you see, these are none of these appeals have yet been determined. Uh, so we stepped down five years of the Archer Commission uh, in a situation where uh, there has been no appeal order as such up to now, given against the ruling of the commission. Um, the, so, so this shows, in a sense, the interaction of the RTI Act with the legal, with the established legal regime. And sometimes um, the a concern made by many people is that when public authorities go to the court and the cases themselves are delayed for many years and in the interim the information is not released despite the order of the RTI commission so that in a way it subverts the intention of the RTI act the RTI regime so just a point that occurred to me because Zahid was talking about the similar experiences in Pakistan uh, I just I want to uh, discuss a little bit this argument about independence of the courts, uh, and I think it's a highly formalistic argument that really holds no uh, water whatsoever. Uh, if that were true, if the RTI Act couldn't apply to the courts, then no act of parliament could apply to the courts. The Act on Environmental Procedures, the labor laws, the anti-discrimination laws, whatever laws were passed, none of, none of them should apply to the courts if parliament can't bind the courts. Uh, and you know we don't see those kinds of arguments from courts, and I don't think it's appropriate uh, for special arguments. These are laws of general application, which set general rules about how uh, institutions in our society must work so as to promote the better public good, uh, and that is not a threat to the independence of the courts. I think it's I think it's a, a you know a, a, a basically a highly formalistic argument that doesn't in substance have any weight. Um, it's interesting, Kishali, that you uh, raise the national security exception, and as I was kind of looking through the exceptions, uh, I I, I realized, I mean, I pinpointed those that are specifically about governmental operations or, you know, the the political establishment operations. But of course, um, some of these other exceptions are claimed in, you know, 
highly imaginative circumstances, uh, to put it politely. Uh, and uh, of course, any exception can be used to push back on accountability and political accountability. Uh, so it's so, 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 but I restricted myself um, uh, just to those that are specifically about the administration or the political establishment. And then finally, Kishali, on your point about trying to get public authorities to see the benefits and want to comply because they recognize that it's in their overall interests. Um, I mean, I, I absolutely endorse that as an idea uh, in the advocacy that we conduct to uh, you know, get these laws passed or get these laws improved or to improve implementation of these laws. We always make those kinds of arguments. Uh, usually, if I'm talking about the benefits of RTI, the first one I mention uh, is about you know, improving Improving relations between citizens and the and the government, uh, which I believe is true, uh, but it's very very difficult in my experience uh, to get public authorities to you know have uh, a sufficiently um, I would say well rounded and long term view to accept that the the short term disincentives to being open almost always seem to override that unfortunately. Toby, I absolutely, I agree with you. Uh, with you uh, about, about you see, it's interesting about the courts and, and the RTI commission um, because see in Sri Lanka also the the extent to which the uh, the extent to which citizens have used the act against the judiciary has been quite limited. Uh, you know, so obviously the principle is there the RTI act applies to the courts and you know judges are subject to the and our act has a has a you know, has a specific mention of the courts being subjected to RTI, but uh, the extent to which people have used the uh, the act against, uh, you know, in respect of information pertaining to the judiciary has been uh, has been a bit limited. There have been some instances where they've asked information on the number of cases pending in court, uh, you know, the laws delays in the appellate courts, for example, um, and these have been resisted very strongly by the judicial establishment because they've come back and said these impact on the independence of the judiciary, you know. So we've been giving some orders where we've said, no, you need to really, um, you know, give the data and you need to give the statistics on these matters. Uh, but the, the question I was speaking of more is the fact that when matters go up on appeal to the Court of Appeal, they get delayed, you know, so three, four years. And as a result, the initial reason or the initial thrust of filing the information requests gets defeated because the matter is pending in the Court of Appeal and the information has been filed for like three years ago or two, two years ago. And ultimately, the, you know, the release of the information does not get done. So that itself is a little bit of a problematic feature, I think, in the RTI process. Though, of course, you need to have appeal to the courts, but then there is, it's a feature that is a little bit problematic. You see, uh, the biggest irony that we are facing in terms of the implementation of the RTI Act in India, uh, there is a very interesting dividing line, and the dividing line is the year 2005, when our RTI law came into place. Prior to 2005, our constitutional courts, the Supreme Court of India and the High Courts, were literally champions of transparency of a lot of matters in government. But 2005 onwards, when they discovered that the Right to Information Act applies to them as well, that's when problem arose. Suddenly, RTI was no longer their baby because the fundamental right to information is not mentioned in the constitution. It's a deemed a fundamental right, which has come out of a series of case law uh, where citizens contested secrecy maintained by government on very important public interest related matters. So they found various ways of reducing the coverage of the right to information. The first thing that they did was because the heads of these constitutional courts were given powers to implement subordinate legislation, they brought in new exemptions, which were not even mentioned in the principal act. Then they kept entire class categories of information, like all judicial records, whether they are pending cases or whether they are resolved cases, are completely outside the purview of the RTI Act. They can be sought only under the court's own rules, which otherwise apply to everything that they do. So today, as a result of which, if I need to access information about pending uh, case records uh, or uh, resolved case records, I have to explain a reason under the court rules. Whereas my RTI Act allows me uh, to seek information without ascribing any reason with any other public authority. And then the courts also have uh, started this practice of not prioritizing very important public interest matters that are brought before them in appeal under the Right to Information Act. And I'll give an example. The issue of whether the heads of the government at our state level, governors, 
whether their office is covered by the RTI Act or not is still a matter that has been kept open for adjudication over the last 12 years. I was an intervener in one of in, in that case. What happened was the gentleman who asked for that information, I'm sorry, I'll just take half a minute and I'll you know, complete this uh, intervention of mine. The gentleman who wanted information was a leader of the opposition at the time of making the request. Then he became the chief minister of the state later on. Then he became the defense minister of the country. Today he is no more, may he so rest in peace. He was the primary litigant in that case. So after he passed mm -hmm. away, the Honorable Supreme Court of India in its infinite wisdom kept the issue of law open as to whether the office of the governor is covered by the RT Act or not, but dismissed the main case which related to facts. So today we have a very peculiar situation in India where the Supreme Court's decision to keep the question of law open is being used by governor's offices across the country, many, many of them to refuse access to information. At the same time, to balance the, uh, you know, the, uh, what I'm saying here, I must also say there are several positive interpretations of uh, various provisions of the Right to Information Act also emanating out of our high courts, one or two mm -hmm. out of the Supreme Court as well. So this is where we have a difficulty, as a result of which my good friend and former Central Information Commissioner, Mr. Shailesh Gandhi, publicly says that perhaps we made a mistake by covering the judiciary mm -hmm. under the Right to Information Law. And this goes against what uh, my good friend Toby said. He said if we had kept them out, they probably would have continued to be a champion of transparency even now. So that is a situation in which we find the judiciary vis-a-vis -vis the right to information act today. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for indulging me for this long. I just want, I, I uh, got disconnected and when I came back, Shari, you were talking about uh, the uh, fee paid to liar, uh, you know, uh, from public funds. So similar case we had here in Pakistan and we decided that uh, attorney um, uh, client privilege communication uh, extend only to the uh, advice given uh, from an attorney to the uh, client and uh, actually what we hear is uh, lots of you know public funds are uh, given to um, to the lawyers uh, uh, to, to represent federation of pakistan in different courts so um, uh, we gave that judgment that if public funds are involved then 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 the, the contract uh, you know, you can take out the uh, uh, private information like uh, address and CIC or, uh, or the uh, telephone number, but if the fee has to be declared. Can I just okay. make one a quick comment? I, I'm afraid I have to go uh, because okay. uh, I have other things. So um, I, uh, I wish thanks for inviting me. Uh, this was a very interesting discussion um, and good luck with the rest of the discussion. And uh, if any questions come for me, I'm going to pass them on to Kishali because I'm sure she will be well well suited to answer them. And thanks, thanks for inviting me. And good luck with the rest of the conference. Uh, I, I would also I, I would also like to beg you because as I mentioned in my presentation, oh. that we have this uh, uh, you know review petition uh, regarding that judiciary case that we are having here in a while. So I have to get ready for that as well. So uh, I would like to thank my host. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. It was a great uh, interaction. Thank you so much, Kishali, everybody. Thank you, Zahir. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for participating in this uh, panel discussion and enlightening the participants. Uh, thank you very much indeed, both, both of you.